Uh, my name is Michael Granado. Uh, I'll take up 10, 15 minutes ish of your time. 15 minutes, probably 15 minutes. Uh, I was asked to give a brief presentation. I'm not really a brief person. Uh, so, in order to be brief, I decided I was going to focus on a single sentence, and hopefully, that'll keep my, my talk here relatively brief. Um, I understand that you guys are in your system? Yep. Where y'all at? We are learning about pre Civil War. Pre Civil War? Causes of the Civil War, 1850. 1850. 1850. Okay, good. Uh, well, this is not 1850s. Go back a little bit. I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about the American Revolution. Uh, if you haven't, then sue the school and get your money back for the class because you think should have talked about the American. Don't sue the school. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, you should have talked about the American Revolution. Uh, the most pivotal moment in U.S. history. And one of the most pivotal moments in, in world history. I'm talking about one of the one of the sentences um, that I think is probably one of the most important sentences ever written in English. Uh, when I teach U.S. history, I always say uh, that if you write a sentence as good as this on your test or your exam or your quiz or paper or whatever it is that you guys do, uh, that you get an automatic 100 in the class. As of yet, no one's been able to do that. I can't guarantee that for y'all because I'm not your teacher. So. Uh, what is the sentence? Uh, it's a sentence from the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, uh, edited by Brent, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, a few other guys that aren't terribly important. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, uh, that among these are right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, it's my argument that this is one of the most important sentences ever written in the English language. Now, other languages, we can debate about that. But in the English language, because this sentence will go on to shape not only the writing of the Constitution, uh, but future U.S. political discussions on through the 18th, 19th, 20th century, and then even to the 21st century. All right, so let's break this down a bit. We're going to do a little bit of hermeneutics, right? Break the sentence down. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Be self-evident. All right, that's great, Jefferson. But what, what's a what's a self-evident truth? What does he mean by that? What do you think he means by that? Yes, ma'am. That you shouldn't have to state it; that it should just be known. Known by who? Everyone. Everyone. That's exactly right. Um, believe it or not, this is a rather new idea. Self-evident truths are a rather new idea. It's a new idea that emerges out of an intellectual movement called the Enlightenment, which we do not have time to talk about. Um, the Enlightenment, ranging from about the 15th century to the 19th century, European history. Uh, one of the things the Enlightenment taught and emphasized was the idea of, of human reason, was the ability of human beings, all of us in here, hopefully, the ability of human beings to reason and to come to truth. For us to be able to know truth by ourselves, as opposed to having somebody else tell us the truth, as opposed to me telling you the truth. Or opposed, especially within this, within this context, as opposed to the government telling you what is true, or any other institution telling you what is true. The idea of the enlightenment is that we as humans had access to truth by ourselves. That if you go sit in a closet and you strain and train and train, you'll come to truth. Boom, it'll just hit you. Right? This is what it means by a self-evident truth. It's exactly right. Alright? Uh, that all men are created equal. Okay? Why did I put confused Daffy Chan here? That all men what's problematic with that statement? There's a lot problematic with that statement. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's no Okay, <laughs> hit the nail on the head there. Two things wrong with that statement. That all men are created equal. Uh, which men are we talking about? White men. White men. Who own land. Who own land. Oh, we're getting even more specific here. Right, so Jefferson has this really lofty idea, right? All men are created equal. So he brings it before the committee, and the committee says, you don't really, you don't really mean all men. Well, 
white men. Okay, okay. You don't really mean all white men, do you? Land only white men. Okay. So the second group that this excludes, who else does it exclude? Women. Half his class. <laughs> Women. Yeah, way more than half his class. <laughs> Women! Okay? So here, we're identifying two big issues that lay at the heart of the revolution. Um, that's what are we going to do about, we as Americans, what are we going to do about slavery? And what are we going to do about women? These are big deals. Even before America became a nation, even before we developed our constitution, debates around slavery and debates around the role of women in society were already taking place. Right? In fact, if you want to relate this to what you're talking about with causes of the Civil War, uh, some historians would argue, including myself, um, that the American Revolution wasn't fully resolved until the Civil War, because it's the Civil War that's going to resolve the issue of slavery once and for all. A little bit later, uh, we're going to resolve the issue of women's rights once and for all. But this is a, this is a big question. It's an open-ended question. Uh, and it's an issue, it's a question that Jefferson wasn't really uh, in agreement on with, with some of his peers. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of debate about this. Okay. That all men are created equal. This is another thing that Jefferson was in disagreement with. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator. All right, cool Jefferson. Um, what are we talking about? Endowed by their creator. Yes, sir? God. God, great. Uh, which one? Whichever one. <laughs> Whichever one? Yes, ma'am. Some form of Christian, yeah. Anybody else want to chime in on that? You know what Jefferson was? You know what religion Jefferson was? Catholic. Catholic. Anybody else want to throw the denomination out there? Protestant, Catholic, Protestant. Um, most likely Jefferson was a deist. Deist. You know what deism is? Um, so you have, we're talking about religious studies, you have several different categories, right? You have polytheism. You know what polytheism is? Polytheism, belief in multiple gods. You know, studied Greek history at all? Yeah. Zeus, oh, yeah. I don't know any other Greek gods, I've used up all my knowledge. The other ones, <laughs> polytheistic, right? Multiple gods, as opposed to monotheism. Monotheism being a belief in what? One God. One God. Judaism, Christianity, Islam are monotheistic. They believe in one God. Deism is a is a is an offshoot of monotheism. Right? It's like a subcategory of monotheism. Deists believe they believe in a God, okay, but they don't believe in a theistic God. Even a lot of terminology, you probably want to throw a book at it. They don't believe in a theistic God. Right? A theistic God is a God who is involved with his creation, his or her creation. Right? A God that cares about you. Right? That's theism. Not only did God create you, but God cares about you. Theism is the opposite of that. That God created you, but that he doesn't really care about you. Deism is the belief that God created the world and everything in it, and then kind of like step back. Do your own thing now. Deuces. It's gone. All right? So, uh, Jefferson and Franklin, possibly Washington, possibly John and Samuel Adams, um, most of these guys were deistic. And this is important because it's going to play a large role in American religious history because one of the things that the founding fathers did not want to do is that they did not want to make the same mistake as the English government did in that they did not want to marry church and state. 
They wanted to keep them separate. Okay? Because in England, you have the Church of England, even to this day. I went to England last year. Right? They have a state-funded church, which means the government, which means all of us in here, when we pay taxes, when you buy your Starbucks drink, when you buy your new notebook or whatever it is, the government takes a certain part of that money, right? Takes a certain part as taxes, which means in the UK and England, part of those taxes goes to pay the church. Founding fathers didn't like that idea. Right, so one of the things that Jefferson wanted to emphasize was America's religious diversity. That's why he's not specific. That's why he doesn't say, are endowed by their Christian creator. He doesn't say that. Because right, he wants to leave it open-ended. Um, and because of his own personal beliefs. You ever heard of Jefferson's Bible before? You don't want to listen to college, but I'm a college teacher, so hopefully they won't kick me out. Jefferson's Bible, uh, he went through uh, the Christian Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament, and he cut out the parts he didn't like. Took a razor blade, cut out the parts he didn't like, which was most of it. Anyway, uh, Jefferson was a weird guy. Okay, endowed by their creator, so it's, it's somewhat open-ended. Right. With certain unalienable rights. Unalienable rights, it's a weird word. You put it on your essays, your English teacher will probably be pretty impressed. Unalienable. Unalienable rights. What is that? Yes, ma'am. You. Um, like rights that can't be taken away by anyone. Yes. Rights that can't be taken away. Taken away by who? The government. The government. That's a baby. That's a baby. Right? Eventually you get to the right of the Constitution. Eventually you get to the writing of the Bill of Rights. Okay, this is a common misconception. What is the Bill of Rights supposed to protect you from? It's supposed to protect you from the government. That's why you have all these rights. Okay? Certain unalienable rights. Rights given to you by God simply because you're a human. That all humans, again, we're going we're to make that all qualified, for that, that all for Jefferson's qualified, that all humans have certain base level rights. Certain basic rights that no one can take away from them. And that no one can deny. And if they, if the government does deny these rights, what do you have the right to do? A yes. fair child. Yeah, if you, if you want to be nice. What did the colonists do? Protest. Uh, protest is a nice word. That's nice. Uh, they burnt stuff. <laughs> Killed people. <laughs> took to the streets. Uh, protest. <laughs> Depending upon your political persuasion. Yes. If the government infringes on those rights, the government takes away your unalienable rights, you by definition, have the right to rebel. In fact, Jefferson would say, you should rebel. You have the obligation to rebel, not to incite rebellion. Always have to qualify this lecture. But you have the obligation. It is not only your right, but it's your obligation to do this if the government oversteps its boundaries, oversteps these boundaries. The government starts to take away some of those rights. Right. Unalienable rights. This is an idea that also uh, begins in the Enlightenment. Uh, the idea that human beings have rights. Believe it or not, that sounds like a no-duh statement to you. Right? But that's an idea that's about 300 years old. It's relatively new. The idea that all people, no matter who they are, no matter what family they are born into, no matter what their skin color, no matter what their religion, that all people have rights. Period. Well, in this case, not period, but get to the period. What are these rights? Jefferson gives three. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is a question I like to ask my students. Right? Pursuit of happiness. What the heck does that mean? Yes, ma'am. You have, you're able to try to get what you want. 
Yeah. Okay. That's a good definition. Um, well, what makes you happy? I like to pursue your happiness. It's like to be able, like you said, like to be able mm -hmm. to do what you would, what makes you happy. And what makes you happy? Um, different things for other people, but like it could be money. It could okay. Be a certain job that you want to have. You okay. It's a weird picture up here. Huh? This is what makes me happy. I like to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. This is me and my friend Jean-Paul on the bottom. His face is red because I'm trying to choke him out. <laughs> trying to make him He's stop breathing. He is my friend. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's mutual. He just got through choking me out, so you've got to give it back to him. All right? That makes me happy. Doing Jiu-Jitsu makes me happy. Um, okay, but what does me doing Jiu-Jitsu have to do with the government? Should the government pay for my jiu-jitsu lessons? They can't take it away. They can't take away my jiu-jitsu? Like your right to do what you want to pursue. Okay, there's no, by the way, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is a really, people have been writing a lot about this because it's really weird, open-ended, and confusing. What else? What else do you think? So, the pursuit of happiness, that we have the right to pursue what makes us happy. Well, what if what makes you happy is kind of weird? Or illegal. Or illegal. Right. What if what makes me happy is elbowing ninth graders in the head? <laughs> Not that I'm going to do that. I going to say the lawsuit. That you the lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I mean, maybe it could be like a... Fair opportunities, so like if it's something that's wrong, you mm -hmm. have like a fair trial, I guess. Sure. Sure. And yeah, I mean, this is definitely an aspect of it. Yeah. What else are you going to say? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's a weird question. It's a weird question. It's a weird word, but in there, happiness. Right? Usually people think of a, it's a bit dated now. I don't know if you guys were. Old enough to have seen it, the Will Smith movie Pursuit of Happiness. Everybody? It's ninth graders. <laughs> All my movie references are. Uh, there's a movie Pursuit of Happiness, and it was about a, it was about a guy, Will Smith. You know, hopefully. Yeah. You don't want to know all about it. You know who Will Smith is. Right? Yeah. It's about Will Smith, and he, he, he's, he's struggling to get a better job, and he has a son, eventually he gets. It's, it's the Pursuit of Happiness, right? He wants to get this really good, high-paying job to provide for his son, provide for his family. Right. So, the pursuit of happiness. Um, so, we have things that make us happy. In my case, it's jiu-jitsu. Maybe it's uh, going to the mall. Maybe it's getting coffee. Maybe it's hanging out with your friends. Maybe it's whatever makes you happy. Uh, Jefferson believes the, the word happiness there that Jefferson has in mind is tricky. right? Because when we think of happiness, we think of uh, boys or girls or, or Starbucks or Chinese food or whatever, right? That's, that makes us happy. Uh, but the word happiness that Jefferson uses is actually uh, it's a Greek concept. Not to bore you with Greek stuff. Um, a Greek concept taken from a Greek philosopher named Aristotle. Aristotle had an idea of happiness called eudaimonia, which doesn't really mean seeking after things that makes me happy on a personal level, but eudaimonia means personal well-being. Um, not acquiring things that make me happy, but being a happy person. Right? Being a happy person within the context of a community, within the context of a society. So, Jefferson uses Aristotle's concept, but he links it with government. That this is one of our unalienable rights. That because we are human, we have the right to pursue happiness and that the government cannot interfere in that pursuit. In fact, in other documents, Jefferson will argue, not only can the government not interfere, but the government should support that. That the government should nurture your pursuit of happiness. What does that look like? 
Well, for one, it looks like education. Um, Jefferson believed in education. Jefferson believed in government-funded education. This is a private school, but he believed in public school education. All right? Um, and believe it or not, that was a controversial opinion at the time. People said, we don't want government in school. We don't want government to pay for school. That's a waste of money. But Jefferson believed that, that it was a right that people should have. Uh, we can also, if we're going to update to the 21st century, we could have debates and discussions about health care. Right? How much should government be involved in health care? Should the government be involved in health care? Should the government offer health care? Should they not offer health care? Uh, these are things that probably make your parents red in the face. Right? Uh, it's an opening question. It's a question that wasn't really answered by Jefferson. Uh, and it's a question that we're still trying to answer today as a society. What role should government play in our happiness? Should government play a role in our happiness? All right, I'll stop myself there. Any questions? Um, Any questions? For the right. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for being uh, for having me. Thank you for having me as well. Yeah. Uh,